Welcome to Module 12 of the OSHA 30 Construction Training Study Guide, the ultimate source for exam preparation. Today we will dive deep into the critical subject of electrical safety from OSHA Standard 1926 Subpart K. Here is the recap. It all starts with welding and cutting. Small drop could damage the valve, causing an unintended release of gas. High stress area. Cables near the holder face the most wear and tear. So In some cases, standard ventilation isn't enough. All right, let's ensure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell so you never miss a safety lesson. Throughout this module, we will break down into understanding, safe practices to control methods and PPE. Let's get started with Chapter 1, Understanding Electrical Hazards and Shock Severity. In this chapter, we're going to uncover the real dangers behind electrical work and how those hazards can impact your safety on the job. Electrical injuries can happen in the blink of an eye, and they are often fatal. There are two main types of electrical injuries you need to be aware of, direct and indirect. Direct injuries are the ones we often think of first. Electrocution, electric shock, burns, and arc flash or blast. These can happen instantly when your body comes into contact with electrical currents. But let's not forget about indirect injuries, things like falls, back injuries, and even cuts to your hands can result from an unexpected electrical shock or explosion. These indirect injuries happen when the shock causes you to lose your balance or react suddenly. Now, let's take a closer look at the factors that determine the severity of an electrical shock. It's not just about getting shocked, what matters is the path of the current through your body, the amount of current flowing, measured in amps, and the duration that the current is flowing through you. Even a small shock can have serious consequences if it passes through vital organs or if the current is high enough. That's why understanding and controlling these hazards is critical for anyone working in construction. Electrical accidents typically occur due to a combination of three factors. But why do these accidents happen in the first place? Unsafe equipment or installation. Work environments are made hazardous by conditions like moisture or weather. Unsafe work practices, such as not using proper protective gear. The good news is that you can control these risks. Guarding live parts of electrical equipment that operate at 50 volts or more is one of the most effective ways to protect yourself. Another important control is to close any openings where conductors enter to prevent accidental contact. Simple steps like providing covers for pull boxes, junction boxes, and fittings can make a big difference in workplace safety. Finally, always remember to be cautious around overhead power lines, many of them are not insulated. Keeping a safe distance, using non-conductive ladders, and wearing PPE when working near power lines can mean the difference between a safe workday and a dangerous accident. By recognizing these hazards and knowing how to control them, you can protect yourself and your coworkers from life-altering injuries. Now, let's test your understanding. Take a moment to think about these questions and discuss them with your colleagues. Let's move to Chapter 2. Safe Practices for Electrical Equipment and Wiring. In this chapter, we'll dive into the essential steps you need to follow to ensure that the equipment and wiring you work with are safe and reliable. Let's start by talking about wiring. It may seem straightforward, but it's one of the most critical elements of electrical safety. The type of wiring you use depends on various factors, including the operation, the materials, the electrical load, and the environment. For example, in construction, wiring must withstand tough conditions, which is why fixed wiring is always preferred over flexible cords. But if you must use extension cords or flexible wiring, 
make sure you're using the right kind for the job. The NEC code requires flexible cords to be marked for hard or extra hard usage. These markings should appear every 24 inches on the cord itself. Why does this matter? Because cords that aren't rugged enough for construction conditions wear out faster, creating a safety hazard that can lead to serious injuries. When it comes to extension cords, choose carefully. Use the correct extension cord for the load and the environment. Whether you're powering tools, appliances, or portable lights, it's important to use cords marked for hard or extra hard service to ensure they can handle the job safely. Next, let's discuss the dangers of defective cords and wires. Electrical accidents can happen in an instant, and one of the biggest causes is worn or damaged wiring. Always inspect your cords and wires before use. Look for things like damaged insulation, which can expose the wiring underneath. If the insulation is compromised, a live wire could be waiting to deliver a dangerous shock. Also, pay attention to the tools and appliances you use. Older or damaged electric hand tools are particularly hazardous because they can become energized unexpectedly. Always ensure that your tools are in good condition and properly grounded before you use them. To help prevent accidents, OSHA has a few critical requirements for working with cords and wires. Live wires must always be insulated and checked before use. Only use cords that are three wire type, which includes a grounding wire. Make sure the cords you're using are marked for hard or extra hard usage. If you come across an unmarked or modified cord, take it out of service immediately. And finally, never remove cords by pulling on the cord itself, always pull from the plug to avoid damaging the wiring. Electrical safety is crucial. By following these guidelines, you can significantly reduce the risk of accidents and injuries. Now, let's test your understanding. Take a moment to think about these questions and discuss them with your colleagues. Time to start Chapter 3, Electrical Protective Devices and Hazard Control Methods. In this chapter, we'll explore how essential safety devices and proper hazard control techniques protect workers from serious electrical injuries. First, let's talk about grounding. It is a fundamental practice for electrical safety, and it serves as your first line of defense against unexpected currents. Grounding creates a low resistance path from a tool or piece of equipment to the earth which helps to safely disperse any unwanted electrical current. Without proper grounding, your tools and equipment can become energized, turning them into a potential hazard. So, what do you need to know about grounding? Always properly ground power supply systems, electrical circuits, and tools. Make it a habit to inspect grounding paths regularly to ensure that they're continuous and effective. Never remove the ground prongs from tools or extension cords, these prongs are vital for grounding, and removing them can put you at serious risk. Now let's discuss the Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter, or GFCI. It is a life-saving device that detects even the smallest differences in current between the black and white wires. If it senses any imbalance, it immediately shuts off the electricity, within 1 40th of a second, to prevent shock or electrocution, GFCIs are especially important when working in wet or damp environments, where the risk of electrical shock is much higher. But GFCIs are just one type of electrical protective device, other key devices include fuses, which automatically cut off power when they detect an overload, preventing overheating or fires circuit breakers, which also interrupt the flow of electricity when they sense an overload or short circuit. Next, let's discuss the importance of the Assured Equipment Grounding Conductor Program or AEGCP. On construction sites, employers are required to use either GFCIs or an effective grounding conductor program to protect workers. Under an AEGCP, all electrical equipment, 
including cord sets and receptacles, must be regularly inspected to ensure safe use. For an AEGCP to be effective, it must include written procedures that are available to all workers, a competent person assigned to ensure the program is properly implemented, daily visual inspections of all electrical equipment to check for damage or wear. The goal here is simple, to ensure that any tool or equipment you use is safe and grounded, preventing electrical hazards before they have a chance to harm you. Lockout slash tagout procedures ensure that equipment and circuits are fully de energized before any work begins. Here's how it works apply locks to the power source after de energizing the equipment. Tag deactivated controls to let others know that the equipment or circuit is not to be used. Tag de energized equipment at all potentially energized points to avoid accidental reactivation. The tags must clearly identify the equipment or circuits being worked on and warn others not to energize them. By locking out and tagging out circuits, you're taking an extra step to protect yourself and your coworkers from accidental energization, which could result in serious injury or even death. Finally, let's talk about safety-related work practices that help prevent electrical accidents OSHA requires employers to barricade areas with exposed, energized equipment, pre-plan work and post clear warnings to prevent accidents, ensure that workspaces and walkways are kept clear of cords and other hazards, use insulated tools specifically designed for working with energized equipment, Prohibit the use of frayed or damaged cords and cables, and ensure that cords are not fastened with staples or hung from nails. These work practices, combined with the proper use of electrical protective devices, are your best defense against the dangers of electrical work. Now, let's test your understanding. Take a moment to think about these questions and discuss them with your colleagues. Let's move to the final chapter Personal Protective Equipment. Watch these two videos for complete guide about PPE, statistics and life-saving tips. That's it for Module 12. Remember safety starts with you. Here is quiz link in the description to help you prepare for final exams. Do you have any questions? Leave them in the comments below and we'll be happy to help. Stay tuned for the next module, where we'll tackle a whole new set of safety challenges. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe to OSHA Outreach Courses.